Hello friends! Are you one of those who want to study the Bible, but sometimes when you open its pages, it seems like it's a foreign language and you cannot understand it? Well, today I have good news for you. I'm here to show you and help you understand the Bible more easily. And let's try to discover some of the tools that we have so that Bible interpretation can be made easy. So now we will go and look at some of the tools and resources that are helpful for Bible interpretation. Of course, when we talk about the Bible, we need the book itself. And in order to be able to understand it better, we need several translations. So I have here, for example, a new international version of the Bible, an amplified Bible, and of course, my favorite translation, the New King James Version of the Bible. You might say, I don't have a Bible, or it's too big to carry around. Don't worry, there are online Bibles available. For example, I would suggest in biblehub.com, you can just type the verse that you want to go to and add the word parallel Bible and it will show you several versions of the Bible that are available from that site. We have some tools that we can use in order to better understand God's Word. First, we need some concordances. You know, a concordance is a book that shows you the occurrences of one word, for example, in the whole Bible. So if you are going to look at the word love, for example, and go to the concordance, then you will find there how many times the word love is used in a certain book and in the whole book of the Bible. Another helpful tool are Bible lexicons. Like in the example that I will use today from the Old Testament, it's helpful to go to the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, or TDOT. There's another lexicon that's also very helpful. It's called TWOT, or the Theological Wordbook of the Old Testament. In the Greek or in the New Testament, you also have the counterpart, which is the TDNT, or Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Another very helpful tool is to go into Bible encyclopedias. You see, when we try to understand what the Bible writer is saying, we need to go and explore the background, the historical background, the cultural background, the way people lived during the time that it was written. Because we have two terms in interpreting the Bible. Number one is what we call exegesis. It is trying to understand what the writer meant when he first wrote the message in the Bible. And the second one is what we call hermeneutics or interpretation. And that is after understanding what the Bible writer meant, now we will try to interpret and try to understand what it means for our life today. Another very helpful tool, of course, are commentaries. But you see, Commentaries are just the last books that we will go to in trying to determine the meaning of the Bible. We must first look at the verse, the text, the forms, and the words and sentences. And then after that, try to compare what other authors or commentators have already written about the text in consideration. And then lastly, but also very important, especially for us Seventh-day Adventists, we also need to look into what the prophet of the Lord, Ellen White, said about the topic. Technology has made available to us through the World Wide Web, yes, through the Internet, many resources that we can use for Bible study and Bible interpretation. So come and try.
try to discover with me those resources. So the very first thing that we will try to see online is to look at available versions of the Bible. So I just type here in the browser, for example, the text that I'm going to show you later, Isaiah 2, and then I put there parallel, and I type Bible, and this comes out of that search, and let me show you the page where it goes to, here. As you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five different versions of the Bible already uh, in parallel, side by side, so you can compare and read and, and try to see if there are any differences in the way that they were translated. Another helpful tool, for example, if you want to know the original words used in the Hebrew, if you are looking at the Old Testament, is also this site, biblehub.com. You just type interlinear and the verse that you want to see. In this case, I'm going to show you later Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. You can see here all the words in the original Hebrew language, the tentative translation below in English, and also even how to pronounce those words in the original Hebrew. There is also a strong concordance number already on top, so that if you want to explore that word, then you can see and look at the original meaning from the Hebrew word. Well, there's just one more very helpful resource that I want to show you, and that is the journals that are available online. These are scholarly articles written by theologians who did research on many topics about the Bible. Now, let me invite you as we try to go through the steps of Bible interpretation. What is the first thing that we need to do? Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural man does not discern or receive the things from the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. So the very first thing that we need to do before we even open the pages of our Bible in order to try to know what it says is for us to pray. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that He will help us know what the Word of God means for our life. Then just open the Bible and first you have to determine the limit of your study because you cannot study one whole book at one time or one whole chapter. The Bible is divided into different sections, chapters, or paragraphs. And that is the first thing that we need to do. We are going to use the example of Isaiah chapter 2. If you open the Bible from the New King James Version, you will already see from the text itself that there are some divisions. And the clue is there are headings, title headings or section headings already. In my Bible here, for example, in Isaiah 2, from verses 1 up to 4, there is the heading, the future house of God. And then from verses 5 down to the last verse in 22 is another section entitled the day of the Lord. However, when I look at the Hebrew Bible, it tells me that there are actually three divisions to this chapter. How do I find that out? Well, it's easy, as I will show you again from the online resources how you can determine the division of the verse through the Hebrew Bible. So in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, you will find there that at the end of verse 4, there is what we call the petuha, which is a marker in Hebrew, I have encircled it there, that tells us that that is the end of the section. And then beginning on the next verse, until verse 11, that's from verse 5, verse 5 to 11, you find another marker we call the setuma, which tells us that in the Hebrew Bible, that is the end of the paragraph. So these markers, it appears again, the setuma at the end of verse 22, that tells us from chapter 12 to 22, that is another section that we can consider for study. 
Now we'll go to step number two, and that is a consideration of the grammatical analysis of the verse. So for this, we need to identify the sentences in the verse. And in the Hebrew, again, there are markers we call the atna, and that is uh, like a s inverted uh, uh, a triangle, actually, without uh, the bottom line that tells us that in that verse there is one sentence. And after that marker, the next word will be the start of the new sentence until we see a colon. It's a mark like a colon at the end, which we call the sof pasuk in Hebrew that determines and marks the end of that whole sentence. The next step after we have identified the sentence uh, division is to look at the verse itself and try to see which are the main words. Now, let me give you a note. In Hebrew, the verbs are usually the one that's emphasized because the Hebrew always emphasizes action. And so looking at the English of verse 12, it says here, For the day of the Lord of hosts, shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. So I noted here in my English Bible several words like day, Lord of hosts, that phrase, upon everything proud and lofty. So those are the main words in the English that I want to try to explore. And in Hebrew, we can also look at the original words through the use of lexicons. Or if you don't have the book, again, the online tools would be very helpful. I go, for example, to two websites, Bible Hub, and just type the verse, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12. And then you go and click lexicon, and it will show you like a table, like this that you see on the screen, that identifies each word in English, in Hebrew, and its form in the Hebrew grammar. Another website that is very helpful is BibleBento.com. You see it on the screen now. It identifies all the words in the sentence, also tells you what form it is, whether it's a verb, a noun, an article, a preposition, and also identifies the next part or the next step, which is the syntax, identifying what is the subject of the sentence, what is the predicate, and what word functions as an object. This is very important, especially in determining the meaning, so that we know who is being talked about in the sentence or the verse, what he is trying to do, and what is the object of the action done by the main character or the subject of the sentence. After we have identified all those words and looked it up in the Hebrew, now we are going to use some online tools in order to look at the meaning. We call it now the analysis of the semantics of the word. Because, you know, in, in Hebrew, like in other languages, one word may have come from or has a root from another word. So we don't only look at the word that is said here, for example, day, but we try to look at where that word, yom, for example, in Hebrew, came from. Some of them came from other Semitic languages like Akkadian, Ugaritic, and if we go into the lexicon, the one I'm using here is theological word book of the Old Testament, then we can see the different meanings of the original word in Hebrew. For step number four, we now have to consider the literary structure of this section that we are studying. If we look at the book of Isaiah and read the encyclopedias and also uh, the text itself, then we can find that there are several forms or literary forms here in the book of Isaiah. Of course, there are some narratives telling us some stories about Isaiah and the kings during his time. There's also, of course, 
this is mainly what we call prophetic literature because Isaiah was a prophet. And that is very evident in verse 1 when it says, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So that word saw. And in chapter 1 also, verse 1, it tells us that the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. So all of this section in the book of Isaiah involving visions, things which he saw that were given to him by the Lord, are prophecies. So this is prophetic literature. But then, if we look closely at verse 12 up to verse 22, we can also see here that it was written like a poem. It is very important for us to consider the literary uh, structure and also the genre of the section we are studying. Why? Because each genre has a different purpose. For example, Paul, when he wrote his letters, what we call the epistles, he is writing to encourage and exhort the believers in the early church. Now, if we go back to Isaiah, our uh, section in consideration from chapter 2, verses 12 to 22, we find here a very beautiful structure, especially in verses 13 to 16. And we see here from 12 to 22, some parallelism. Parallels are very common in Hebrew poetry. And so in chapter uh, 2, verse 12, for example, for the day of the Lord of hosts, that is parallel to what is said in verse uh, here in this chapter, for example, in verse 17. Also, verse uh, 14 and 15. But also, if you look at the original Hebrew, and you can see it later in the screen, we see here that in the grammatical structure also, it clearly shows a parallel in how the prophet wrote this. But not only that, considering verse 13, for example here, the cedars of Lebanon and then the oaks of Bashan, they are both made of wood, natural materials. And then it's parallel in verse 16, it says here that upon the ships of Tarshish, and upon the beautiful uh, sloops, which are all ships are made of wood. So it's not only in the grammatical, but also in, in the materials used that they are parallel to each other. Also in verses uh, 14 and 15, the high mountains and the lofty hills, both made of stone, and it parallels in verse 15, the high tower, and the fortified walls, which are made of stone. So you see here, uh, Isaiah used a beautiful uh, structure to convey the message that this prophecy has several fulfillments. First, it has a local fulfillment. In the immediate context of the time of Isaiah, this refers to the time when God will bring judgment upon his people for their idolatry, as mentioned in verses 18 and 19 and also in 21. Second, it also tells us that the day of the Lord is a day of judgment for the surrounding nations, the hidden nations around God's people. And indeed, this was mentioned even by the other prophets, Jeremiah, also Joel, and even Hosea and Zephaniah and Zechariah, they all mentioned the day of the Lord of hosts. You see, that statement means judgment upon the nations of the world. But lastly, it also has an eschaton, an eschatological, an end time fulfillment when this judgment will happen for the whole universe. And we have a clue here, for example, in verse 19, it says here, from verse 18, But the idols he shall utterly destroy or abolish. And 19, they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. What picture do we see here? It's a picture of the second coming. That when Jesus will come again, all the wicked 
they will hide in the caves and they will ask the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them. Then this section, Isaiah 12 to 22 of chapter 2, is a message of judgment. But nevertheless, it is also a message filled with hope. Because if you look at verse 22, there's an invitation here. The language gives a very strong warning. It says, stop, cease from focusing your attention on man who will just pass away. And then if we go at the context of the chapter in verse uh, 2, for example, in the latter days, talking about the judgment to come, and then in verse 3, there's an invitation from the Lord, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord. And so this is also a message not only of judgment, but of hope. But hope for who? Hope for those who will stand with the Lord of hosts. But for those who will lift themselves up, then it will be a message of judgment for them. Now, we are ready to go to the second to the last step in this process of biblical interpretation, determining the theology of this section. What does it mean? We need to ask at least three questions. First, what does this section of our study tell us about God? Second, what features of God can we see in this text? And third, what principles can we learn? And what does this text contribute to the understanding of a major theme or topic in the Bible? Looking at our specific example, we can see that God here is depicted as a God who comes to fight against wickedness and pride. Second, in spite of that, we also see here that God is a God of justice. He will bring an end to wickedness in this world. And third, we can also see here that he is a God of love. Why? Because in spite of the judgment that he will bring, there is always an appeal, a warning, and an invitation for people to come to him and recognize him as their God and their Savior. Now finally, we've come to the last step in our journey of discovering what the Bible is saying. After considering everything, now we go to secondary sources. We now turn to commentaries and try to see what other authors are saying about this text and about the theme or topic that we are trying to study. We need to also look at what Ellen White said. And Ellen White clearly says in several places in her writings that the day of the Lord refers to the second coming of Jesus. And that will be a day of judgment, but that will also be a day of salvation. And so finally, in concluding our study, we explored all the tools that we need, and then we look at the steps. But remember one important thing at every step that we go through, especially when we are confused and we don't know where to go in way of interpreting what the text means, we need to go back to the very first thing that we did. And what is that? We need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to lead us in understanding God's word. And I know that if we continuously seek for God's word, like what the prophet Jeremiah said, God's word will be to us the joy and rejoicing of our hearts. So God bless, and I hope you learned something from this short video of how we can better understand and interpret our Bible. Come the fountain, every blessing to my heart.